Welcome everyone. Welcome to another live stream. As you can see, I am joined by a full house today to celebrate the upcoming launch of Asa Win Stanley's book. He is here with us, the author, The Weaponization of Anti-Semitism, uh, How the Israel Lobby Brought Down Jeremy Corbyn. We're also joined by Roger Waters of Pink Floyd. Uh, he has a incredible tour that's received a lot of backlash around the world um, from these very Israeli lobby forces. And we also have Katie Halper, friend of the show and host of the Katie Halper Show. How are you all doing today? Good to see you. Good to meet some of you, too. Hello. Great. Hello. Hey, Chi. Great. Got Roger. Danny, Asa. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Great to I be with all of you. What? I'm in Prague. Just in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> great, great, great. Are you, uh, he's in, are you in London, Asa? That's right. Yeah. Here in and, London. Uh, and Katie and I are in the U.S. of A, um, where all the dreams come true. New York City. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So let's get started. Before we do, though, you know what to do, everyone. Make sure that you are liking the stream, sharing it, boosting it in those very simple ways. Um, but without further ado, let's begin. And let's begin first uh, with you, Asa. Could you talk about the book? Uh, what uh, made you want to write it? Uh, from what I understand, it is years in the making. It is a phenomenon that is still ongoing. I've heard many of your commentaries. It's still ongoing phenomenon. But the Israel lobby, Israel, uh, we haven't talked much about it on this channel as much as I would want. So give... Uh, maybe viewers an understanding of what this book is all about, uh, why it's important, and I will pull it up as you do so. I'll pull up where you can find it on OR Books. Yeah, thanks, Danny. So the book is called Weaponizing Antisemitism, and it's about what happened to Jeremy Corbyn when he was the leader of the Labour Party, and it's what happened to his movement as well. So there was a popular movement unexpectedly bringing him to the leadership of the mm. Labour Party in 2015. And there was all kinds of weapons used against him and anti-Semitism, I argue in the book, the smears of anti-Semitism were really the most effective weapon against him. And it's I, I lay out the history of in my book of how the state of Israel and its lobbyists in the West habitually use this uh, issue as a weapon against his critics and smear and misportray its critics as anti-Semitic, as anti-Jewish. And, you know, your two other guests here today are great examples of that, you know. And the fact that Katie is a Jewish woman doesn't stop the Israelis and the pro-Israelis using that as a weapon. So, you know, these kinds of smears are really powerful, unfortunately, still. They're not really believed on a mass level. They're not believed... Um, widely but they're believed enough to cause um problems and to cause 
and you know, you know, we we see that you know Jeremy Corbyn is is now out of the Labour Party. He's no longer even a Labour Party MP, and so this issue, you know, I've been covering it. I've been reporting uh, for the Electronic Intifada really for years on this issue, and the book I was just motivated to just bring all this reporting together in a an easy to read narrative, which would is a bit of a political thriller, and I kind of approached it as a, like a true crime story, really. Um, which was how I pitched it to all the publishers and agents that I pitched it to. And as, as Roger knows, because he's heard the, I sort of regaled him with my, uh, <laughs> with my woes for years about this. And, um, you know, I had a really hard time getting this published. It was really difficult. Um, writing it wasn't that hard, but getting it published was incredibly difficult. So all books, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't find a British publisher at the end of the day, that's the reality. All books is an American publisher, albeit with a kind of transatlantic footprint. But um, yeah, that's to be commended to publish it for publishing it finally in the end. But it did, I mean, I, I started writing it in 2019, you know, and, and then it took me two years to find a publisher. So that in itself shows that this weapon is still quite powerful. What what did you find? What are some things that you found or, over the course of your research? If you want to just uh, give a little bit of a, I don't know, a snapshot for folks to, to jog their interest. Yeah. So, for example, chapter four is titled The Lobby and it's about the Israel lobby and it's about kind of the guts of the book, I suppose. And it gets into what undercover investigations by Al Jazeera revealed, I'll, you know, you know, I think a lot of your viewers will probably remember and I know. Roger and Katie will certainly remember that in 2017, Al Jazeera did undercover investigation into the Israel lobby in the UK by infiltrating one of their reporters into the pro-Israel lobby. He did a really good job at pretending to be one of them. Um, he was uh, he was a German reporter, and so he sort of came across as this um, young uh, Zionist, this young non-Jewish Zionist who was sort of a sympathetic German social democrat. Um, and it worked really well. They sort of spilled everything to him. They offered him jobs. At one stage, he even got offered a job in the Israeli embassy. They decided to decline because they thought that would be a bit too, bit too risky. Um, but they found out some amazing things. So, like, for example, and a lot of the documentary focused on the Labour Party during the, the height of the Corbyn years and the height of the attacks against Jeremy Corbyn. And what it showed that you had, as I argue in the books, agents for a hostile foreign power the Labour Party, uh, uh, Israel against the Labour Party, certainly hostile against the Labour Party, acting against the British political process because they wanted to stop Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister. Um, and uh, we see things like, for example, this one of these agents, most notoriously Shai Massot, who was almost certainly a, uh, an agent of the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is packed full of Israeli uh, former Israeli spies, you know, military intelligence and so forth. He was trying to basically operate um, pro-Israel groups within the Labour Party, groups that presented themselves as either pro-Israel groups or Jewish groups or both. He was trying to operate them as essentially cutouts for the Israeli embassy. And we have on camera Michael Rubin, a young um, staff member of Labour Friends of Israel, who is now the director of Labour Friends of Israel these days, He's on camera saying to the undercover journalist that um, we talk to the Israeli embassy most days and that, you know, essentially they are working in very close coordination with the Israeli embassy. And this is a group within the Labour Party that has, you know, quite, you know, I was checking their, their um, list of supporters in the Labour Party today. One of their vice chairs is the shadow chancellor. So like the, you know, the, the, the finance, the person who would become finance minister of Britain if Labour Party won an election. This person is a supporter of Labour Friends of Israel, a group which works very closely with the Israeli embassy. So, you know, I argue in the book, and it's something that's got me in a little bit of uh, trouble, <laughs> we should say. I agree in the book that that is, I, I, in my view, that is a national security issue. I mean, I think that is a problem. You know, obviously, you know, there are, you know, it, it depends on what your definition of national security is, and it depends on, you know, but I would say the, Labour, the state of Israel was 
definitely hostile to the Labour Party left and definitely hostile to Jeremy Corbyn. So I don't think that it's, I think it's a fair description to say that it was a hostile foreign power. Um, and, you know, that, that, so that's that's one example of um, what I get into in the book. And I try and sort of assemble all this stuff into a, a compelling narrative. Yeah, great, great. Well, as you said, Asa, there's a lot of relevance of this book to what's happening now, including to our esteemed guests here. Roger, can we turn to you? You are on this huge tour right now. Um, this is not a drill. And uh, you have received a lot of backlash, it seems, from these very same forces and their allies in the European countries. Could you talk about what's going on right now in terms of what is prompting this? Uh, I've seen recently, and I'll pull up some um, reactions to a recent performance you just gave in Germany where you uh, were talking about the slain uh, Palestinian journalist um, and how she and Anne Frank kind of share a relationship. And that has gotten a lot of, um, a lot of backlash. I wonder if you could talk about what you've experienced uh, with this concert, uh, with these forces and what they're trying to do here? Well, well that little, that particular uh, kind of small piece of news um, stems from the fact that one of the songs I do, about three songs in to my show, is a song from 1987 from an album I made called Radio Chaos, I think. Is it? Yeah, it is, called The Powers That Be. And, it, and it's basically a song saying, just explaining my position, which is that the powers that be are unbearably vicious uh, in many ways. And they routinely, lots of powers that be in lots of different countries, this isn't country specific or nationality specific or gender specific or religion specific or specific to any of those defining facts. It's specific to the fact that the ruling class will kill you if they have to. And it doesn't matter when they are or what part of history, you are then a victim of state murder, terror, or whatever. And these two women, who, who are both mentioned, I mention a number of people, but they're all victims of state violence in my show, okay? So, and two of them happen to be Anne Frank, who, as we all know, was the young Jewish woman who was finally kept, killed by the Nazis in, um, she was found in Amsterdam and, um, and then sent to a concentration camp and died there. Um, and she's very well known because when she was in hiding in Holland, she wrote a diary and the diary was then found and published and it's a very, very famous book now and so on and so forth. And the other woman is, is Shireen uh, Abu Akhle, who maybe some of your viewers don't know, but was a journalist for Al Jazeera. She's Palestinian American. And uh, had, has worked for many, many years uh, in the occupied territories and in Gaza, uh, carrying news stories there. And um, she was shot dead by an Israeli sniper a year ago, almost exactly a year ago now. So, that, so although they are, they are, their deaths are seventy-seven or seventy-eight years apart, they are nevertheless connected by the fact that they were murdered by a state. Shireen was murdered by the Israeli state of Israel and Anne Frank, as we know, was murdered by the Nazis, by the state of Germany. Uh, yeah, and we, we see like the way these um, Israeli government officials and pro-Israel lobbyists are attacking you online, Roger. And, and they very, it's, this is a perfect example of what they do. And it's the kind of thing I get into in my book as well. They selectively show a screenshot of your show where it's, yeah, we can see it on the yeah. screen there. Here we go. Danny Danon, who's the um, Israel's ambassador to the UN, he's showing this screenshot, Shireen Abu Akleh and Anne Frank, and he's sort of focusing in on those two names. But actually, you know, the show itself, you have all this whole long list of names of victims of, you know, as you describe state violence there. And it's yeah. they're, 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 they're trying to monsterize you, I think. Well, yeah, they are. But they're, they're specific, the specific problem with having the names Anne Frank and Shireen Abu Akleh shown in the same context as victims of state violence. The problem here 
well, not here, I'm in Prague, but in Germany, is how dare you create this false equivalence between the Third Reich and the state of Israel? Well, I'm, I'm, all I'm pointing out is that, and I'm not even saying, I don't say, oh, look, these two states both murder. They do, that's all. They're murderous. Okay, so are lots of other states. So was South Africa during apartheid. So were we when we were colonial settlers in India and Australia and wherever. So, so, so were all the early Americans. We were, we've all done it. We've all been at it. We're all murderers somewhere in our past. But those of us who care about our race, the human race, and the possibility for it to survive, and for us to move forward into the future and go, oh, hold on a minute, maybe it's not great that the state that the state is murdering people with no recourse to the law, no attention to human rights. You know, it, I actually made a little speech in, 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 at the gig in Prague last night, and it went out in cinemas all over the world. And, that, and what I did, I'll tell you what I did, because I thought I should. I do two songs where I'm um, where I'm dressed up in mock. Mock. I don't wear an SS uniform, by the way, all you idiot journalists who said that I was wearing an S. It's not an SS uniform. You could tell if it was, because it wouldn't have crossed hammers on the armband. Okay, it would have a swastika or something if I was or it would have SS insignia. You know, so that's not what it is. It is, however, um, an attempt to demonstrate the dangers that, that are extant in the world now where populist fascism is gaining a foothold in many countries, exemplified, if I, to pick an example, by Bolsonaro in Brazil, who came within a hair of extending his run as the evil, tyrannical, dictatorial leader of that beautiful country. And so we are standing at the edge of a very, very slippery slope where, because of the failure, if I go on too long, you stop me, Danny, please, but because of the failure <laughs> of um, the neoliberal capitalist uh, system and the fact that most people in the world now are living on the edge of or in deep misery because the world, the Western world certainly is, and maybe some of the Eastern world as well, is completely organized for the benefit of about four unbelievably rich people. And they run the world and they don't give a F about you or me or, any, or anyone out. They don't care about whether we live or die. Or, they just want to maintain the status quo so that, so that they can go on getting rich and rich. And, I know this sounds simplistic, and of course it is, but nevertheless, that is the picture that you see if you look out your window. Yeah. Um, and so there are those of us here, Kate is one of them, Ace is one of them, you're one of them. We resist the status quo. It is our duty as human beings, to put our shoulders to the wheel of resistance against the status quo. And we are faced with enormous opposition to that task because they, the oligarchs, own almost all the media and they use it to try and crush our resistance. That is what is going on with me now. That is why all the English newspapers are going, he dressed up as an SS bloke and paraded around in, in uh, da, 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 you know, in Berlin. And so the Berlin police are now investigating him. Maybe they'll throw him in prison. Hurrah, put him up against the wall and shoot him, you know, whatever. So they're trying to create that narrative and hope that I come to a sticky end somewhere. And they, and then they, they're not, None of the journalists in England, by the way, not one of them is studying the details of what they do. So when they see in the Jerusalem Post, he wore an SS, they don't even go, really? Where is it? There it is. That's not an SS uniform. It's a pastiche of, of something that looks like something that somebody in the Third Reich might have worn in the late 30s or, or during the early 40s. But, but if you look at it, it's got crossed hammers on it. I, I saw so many people online, Roger, like of your supporters 
and right. just people people with any kind of common sense basically saying you just you know of replying to all these kind of politicians and whatnot uh, condemning you and, and trying to sort of raise this alarm about you people just saying you know you might as well condemn charlie chaplin for the great dictator right. Yeah. Some of these people um, probably would because they're that uh, <laughs> ignorant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Katie, I want to kick it to you because I haven't been able to speak to you in any platform since the Hill situation. And I'm wondering if you could speak because I feel like it's very related to everything that Asa and Roger are talking about. And I just want your take on that. And also maybe a little bit about being a i guess a quote-unquote american jew you know and speaking out against uh israel and um you know facing that kind of backlash that you know uh i i know can be very customary so right. you. have they called you a self-hating jew katie oh well can yeah, i, I mean, katie, katie yeah. can i interrupt i want to interrupt just briefly just in case danny's got somebody in the background there because my brain is ticking away only because last night, or was it, this, no, this morning, I watched two fantastic clips. And one is my friend, Naomi Winborn Adrisi, okay, who, you know, you must know Naomi, right, Asa? You know, she's yeah. a big, big Labour Party in my mind. She's been thrown out of the Labour Party. Yeah. She's a yeah, Jewish, Jewish lady. Jewish for Labour. Yeah, and blah, blah, blah. And whatever. Anyway, there's her, and there's to her talking about how... The first time in her life she was called a self-hating Jew was when she was 19 years old and she'd organized a meeting with some Holocaust survivor and they were shouted down in her and blah, blah, blah. And it's, she, it's, she's so articulate and wonderful. And she was recently invited to, uh, no, elected, not invited, elected to the Labour Party NEC after Starmer had thrown her out of the Labour Party. And so he then threw her out again. Anyway, that's one. And the other is Ken Loach, another really good friend, and also a very, very clear thinker, as we know, the famous film director. And, and there's a clip of him as well, talking about the Labour Party and about Keir Starmer, and really describing how slippery that slope is and how all those of us who would support a left-wing Labour Party how frustrated we all are, because what we have now is the same situation that you have in the United States, which is you have a two-party system where they're indistinguishable, really. They both support the ruling class and the status quo. It doesn't matter which one's in power, except to a matter of degree. Occasionally, one of the leaders of one of the parties is just a hair crazier than the leader, but they're, but they're all held down on destroying the earth. So... You know, those just, we, we want leaders who want to save the earth and who believe in human. Imagine a leader who actually believed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'm going to shut up, but if there is anybody who could find those clips, they might be useful later on. Oh, I thought it's, you were going to nominate me as leader. You <laughs> yeah. would make a great leader. Yeah. yeah. Um, Katie for leader. Yeah, Katie for leader. Yeah, Katie. KFL rolls off the tongue. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, thanks so much for having me, Danny, and thanks so much for talking to us, uh, Asa and Roger. But yeah, I mean, people probably may maybe some people know, maybe people some people don't, but I was fired and banned by the Hill for making a video for writing a, a script arguing that Israel is an apartheid government and defending Rashida Slave, who had said that from smears from people like the ADL and people like uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and basically uh, subtler smears from people like Jake Tapper. And so I wrote a script uh, about that. I filmed it at the Hill. The Hill is where I used to appear every week on the show Rising as a guest. And then I also did some hosting. And this is when I did a hosting gig I filmed that. They told me they wouldn't release it. I had a back and forth with them trying to get, convince them to release it. They could have a countering voice after whatever they wanted to do because I thought it was an important video to get out there. And then I was told uh, I wouldn't need to be coming back to the show, which I had been appearing on every week for three years. So that was frustrating. Um, the good news, I guess, is that luckily uh, the great people of um, Breakthrough News 
produced the video with me. So I went into their studio at the People's Forum right here in New York City and um, shot the video. So you can actually find that video that I filmed from a news desk. Um, I refilmed it again, just standing up, basically. And, uh, you know, I think that it probably was... I don't know if I had some cushion being being described as a self-loathing Jew versus an anti-Semite, but uh, I think that it is interesting. Something that we see in your book, Asa, is how Jews who are critical of Zionism or even just critical of the state of Israel are kind of yeah. denied their Jewish identity or race or called fake Jews. Or um, And what I always point out is that the very idea that Jews are a monolith who all support the state of Israel is an anti-Semitic idea. I mean, the people who constantly use the word Jewish and Zionist interchangeably are like rabid anti-Semites, right? The Zionist plot, the Zionist conspiracy, and uh, Israel defenders who, who basically suggest that if you're Jewish, you have to be a Zionist. And that conflation is in itself anti-Semitic. I think that's one of the main reasons that it's so important to push back against the IHRA, um, right? That new definition of anti-Semitism that claims that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. And again, you know, people love using the language of social justice to, to try to, people like weaponizing the language of social justice. This is also something that your book addresses, Asa. Uh, yeah. Someone, I don't remember, someone from the Israel lobby talks about uh, demo democratic socialist uh, language that they want people to use. Um, and we see people trying to manipulate these ideas, kind of weaponizing wokeness to defend Israel. And if you want to use that language, then what about the erasure and silencing of Jews? That should be something that you care about. Uh, but of course they don't because they're just using these terms uh, selectively and in a way that weaponizes and they're happy to silence any Jews whose narrative uh, contradicts their narrative. And that's why I think it's important for Jews to show like not all Jews are APAC supporters. In fact, most Jews aren't APAC supporters, but the loudest, most politically connected, uh, well-funded ones are. I'm glad, so glad you bring up the internet. It's the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and and it's really good that you bring that up because that is a really good um, demonstration of the smokescreen that's thrown over everything. So we're all, or we, a lot of us are, are talking about a definition of anti-Semitism that actually strikes at the whole problem. I've just spent, as I say, I've done six gigs in, uh, or five gigs in Germany, and I'm going to do my last gig in Germany in Frankfurt next week, and whatever. So, so it, this is sort of crucial to. Th in Germany, it's so sad. You walk about and you realize that you can't actually have a conversation with anybody because they are the walking dead. Because Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. So it's unthinkable for most it's not true of all germans there are many young activists and in fact they're probably an appreciable minority but that you never hear about it's very difficult to hear their voice in germany who would be happy sitting in in this room with us now and talking about this because they too would understand the incredible danger that is in Germany now, which is that all throughout the Bundestag and the government and, and through all of the media and in consequence lodged in the minds of most of the population is this, because of what happened between 1933 and 1945, Israel, which is the monolith, those are the Jews, that's the Jews, the state of Israel is the Jews, can do no harm. No! Nope. But that, no, I can't mention it. If you do, the Berlin police may arrest you and lock you up. They're talking about trying to convict me of a crime. For doing it is a really extreme in Germany. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, Germany is like the hotbed. And, and it's so sad. I and one Sorry. of the, oh no, no, one of the people, I mean, I, I feel torn often because I don't want to suggest that it's worse to be silenced if you're a Jew than if you're a non-Jew, because that, of course, suggests 
and lends itself to the silencing of Palestinians, right? Like I, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that Jews have a unique voice, but they, I mean, it's unique. It's not more important, but it's unique, right? And I think that for some people, it's important to see, um, it's like a teachable moment or almost like a gateway case. Yeah. I think that people realize like there's this artist in, in Germany, Adam Bloomberg, who is very supportive of yeah. Roger, whose mother is a Holocaust survivor, who yeah. is who had his show canceled in Germany. So you're having Germans who were, reminder, spoiler alert for people just catching up, responsible for the Holocaust, right? Those were the people who did it. Not all Germans, obviously, but that's where it came from. You have these people telling a Jew whose family, part of his family was wiped out. These people are telling this guy that he's an anti-Semite. And the, what makes him an anti-Semite is his daring to see Palestinians as human beings who have human rights. And a lot of Jews trace their commitment to uh, human rights to their own Jewish radical tradition of internationalism, which is kind of a whole other discussion. But for lots of Jews, you know, hey. never again is not just never again in Europe um, in that particular moment of the Holocaust. It's never again for anyone and to anyone. I mean, Gabor Mate is another example of someone who is a Holocaust survivor who focuses a lot on trauma. And for him, his experience as a Holocaust survivor is something that makes the um, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and subjugation of Palestinians very uh, personal. And again, I think that for some people, I think there's it's, it, it's very important as a teaching tool to remind people of this because it creates a kind of cognitive dissonance where it's like, wait, you have the Germans telling a Jew that he's anti-Semitic or Another example of this, and you talk about this in your book, Asa, you, re you refer to um, Jerem, uh, Jerem Hagee, Pastor Hagee. John Hagee, who, yeah. What's his first name? John Hagee? John, yeah. Yeah, um, who talks about how Hitler was a hunter um, created by God. I mean, this guy is such an anti-Semite. Of course, these people want us Jews to all return to Israel. And I think all of us but 400 will burn forever in eternal damnation or something well you have katie you have to convert to christianity in the end right. times or you are yeah. gonna you know perish in the eternal but i fire. think even still there's like a there's a quota system i don't think all of us will get in even if we do right. accept jesus christ as our lord and savior you're probably right but, yeah I, I need to study this theology yeah we gotta get point. we gotta <laughs> we should have a rapture study group that we can start. yeah but i should i shouldn't laugh about it because it is horrific and a lot of people do believe it and you know and, and just to sorry wrap up when i was yeah, saying no, one on. thing sorry and then i'll pass it to you because this is your your book and your expertise but the fact that you have netanyahu cozying up with john hagee who's obviously an anti-semite and you have him cozying up with uh poland and hungary where there's a very strong anti-semitic uh kind of alt-right presence and it was amazing to watch netanyahu in Poland right around, he was visiting Poland right when they had passed this law saying you couldn't blame the Polish people for collaborating. Like you couldn't blame the Polish people for participating in the Holocaust. And you have Netanyahu there in Poland at the time defending this right-wing anti-Semitic government. And then you have like the foreign minister back in Israel being like, are you kidding the Poles? Like they drink anti-Semitism as they're nursing their mother's milk. I mean, it was kind of fun to watch like right-wing Zionist on right-wing Zionist uh, disagreement. But this is important for people to know because there are people who really, they're, they're obviously people out there who are incredibly cynical, manipulative, weaponizing anti-Semitism. But then you actually have legit people who I think are in good faith and they don't understand how Israel can be anti-Semitic and Israel itself can be buddies with anti-Semites. And I think when you show people that, that opens their minds to understanding and starting to see through Israeli propaganda. I wanted to, um, uh, I mean, those are all, those are all great points, Katie. And, and I wanted to go back to a point you made and ask Asa about it uh, because it directly relates to his book, this like weaponizing called wokeism, but also like the social justice framework. We see it in other countries very clearly. The United States has the national endowment for democracy. It sends all these supports, all these opposition forces, and they all consider themselves you know, uh, forces for good and they're against authoritarianism. And Asa, you're talking about the Jewish labor movement. Um, and could you talk about JLM, its role here, its connections to the Israel lobby? 
And what role did it play? Because Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party, ostensibly the party in the UK most connected to labor, um, as well as to the Palestine Solidarity Movement, etc., at least um, from his side. But the JLM kind of acted as this force, it seemed like, to undermine him while portraying itself as being some sort of left wing cause. Could you talk about it in, in its role, its connections to perhaps some not so uh, uh, left wing causes? Right. I think this is a really um, important part of my book. And it's it really goes to the, the crux of this issue that Katie was talking about, of the kind of generalized weaponization of identity politics, where there was this, um, you know, it's hard to describe for your American viewers who, who didn't necessarily go through it. But the Corbyn years... Made the British media is already insane. It's still it's more even more insane than it ever was now. Um, you know the Ukraine hysteria, for example, is just you know it, it, it. You can't believe anything that's reported about Ukraine, for example. Um, but the Corbyn years were just like it was a pure madness. Like it was a mass hysteria, and we just saw the wildest things put out there. And this kind of weaponization of identity politics was really the most effective thing. The the the, the Jewish labor movement, oh, we seem to have lost Danny. Um, so we're taking over Danny's stream. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no. I was just something <laughs> something fell. Keep keep okay. going. I just didn't right, want to cool. look like I was doing other things. <laughs> All right, good. Um, well, uh, uh, that's okay, Danny. You know, we can, we can't uh, afford to lose allies, guys. Uh, that's what that's Danny. No, the Israel lobby did not take me down okay. and out of the stream. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, the Jewish labor movement. So, like, uh, the, the Jewish labor movement represents uh, the, the trend of left, the so called left wing Zionism. Um, what you've got to remember, you know, every, you know, everyone and his dog sort of nowadays is kind of against the, Net the Netanyahu government. And the problem. <sighs> The problem is that like Netanyahu is not the only bad guy, right? So like Shireen Abu Akleh, for example, was not killed by the Netanyahu government. It was killed by the supposedly moderate government of, um, you know, the, the, the coalition government of uh, Naftali Bennett and Yaya Lapid is supposed to be this moderate Israeli liberal, right? Um, and uh, until 1977, all the Israeli governments were supposedly, they, they described themselves as socialists, but they were Zionist socialists, which meant that um, Palestinians didn't have equal rights. Palestinians were driven out, violently driven out of Palestine by the Zionist militias that founded the Israeli army. Um, now, you know, we could go into a long history lesson. I'm not going to do that, but basically the JLM represents the kind of rump of that Israeli quote unquote left, what was once called labor Zionism, um, which is now a very marginal force, even within Israel, you know, the, the Israeli labor party now, I mean, at one point it was down to like a few, like three seats or something in the Knesset. Um, I when think I grew up, the feeling, what, uh, what I absorbed and I lived in a very kind of Labour Party House committee meetings and blah blah blah. You know, my mother was a communist until fifty six, and then became Labour Party. So, well, but the but the what little I ever heard or knew was, I have this image in my mind of these sort of rugged communists up there in their sandals digging in the kibbutzim. Digging in the dirt. Well, yeah, in the the kibbutzim exactly, and that was what was sold to us for all those years. From when I was five until I until until I until when my eyes were awoken were, yeah. were opened when I went there and that was yeah. until two thousand and six yeah and up until then I, it never crossed my mind you know, absolutely and this was what was sold in the West and like um, there's even an episode of Mad Men about it right where hmm. the, the, there's um, one of the Mad Men has. Um, uh, Moshe Dayan on a poster of Moshe Dayan on the wall and the madmen they have to mark literally market Israel in the West and uh, anyway the point is that um, the, so the, the 
the Israeli Labour Party um, is relatively is pretty marginal now within Israeli politics. Although it was in the last, it's played a small role in the last coalition government. Um, but it's not dominant. It's, it'll, it'll, you know, almost certainly never be dominant again, like it, it was before 1977. But what it is useful for the purposes of Israeli propaganda is in the West and in Britain. It played this really, um, this really key role, I would say. Now, JLM was really a marginal. It's very small organization, and it was a, it was, uh, and I argue and lay out in the book, it was essentially a dead organization that was revived in 2015 specifically that you know in september 2015 uh, after jeremy corbyn was elected to the leadership of the labor party for the first time specifically to sabotage jeremy corbyn from within the labor party but, and the reason that was so effective was because it was a within the labor party and b it was labor friends of israel uh, sorry it was it was the jewish labor movement not labor friends of israel so, of course, the, both of those groups, they had more or less the same line, but Jewish labor movement focused on the idea, well, this is anti-Semitism, whereas the Labour Friends of Israel was more, you know, open this about is, its pro-Israel yeah. agenda. And obviously and so, they had to destroy Corbyn because Corbyn actually believes in the Universal Declaration of Human yeah. Rights, interestingly enough, from the same year as the Nakba. So because he believes in him, and he genuinely does, you can see it's, it's in everything that he's ever said or ever written or ever spoken. Very much like very, I've been told anyway, I didn't grow up in a Jewish family, but a very strong tradition that you stand with the oppressed. That's why there were so many Jews in, in, involved in the civil rights movement yeah. back in the 60s, you know, going down into the Jim Crow South. Uh, yeah, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, two of them, the three men killed there, two exactly. of them were Jewish, one was black, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the the, the other thing I wanted to say about what Katie was saying about John Hagee is, like, just to emphasize, this is not a marginal figure. Like, people will remember from, you know, when, when John McCain right. was running for president, John Hagee was, like, his... Pastor, spiritual advisor right. yeah that was one, it yeah. his spiritual advisor until this the scandal about the the sermon that you mentioned about hitler being a hunter sent by god to drive the jews to israel quote unquote this kind of real classic anti-semitism was revived and he was kind of john mccain had to distance himself from him now the israeli government has done the opposite it's just got closer and closer to john hagee you know when they opened the um embassy the new um, American embassy in Jerusalem in 2018. It was John McCain, uh, sorry, it was John Hagee and uh, another Christian Zionist called Robert Jeffress who was leading the prayers there. Right. Um, and, you know, these are really dangerous people. And, you know, they're not marginal. Like uh, uh, John Hagee's um, organization, uh, Christians United for Israel, claims to have more than 2 million members. Last time I checked, I think it may be even more now. Now, how involved those members are, I don't know. I can't say. But this is not, you know, the, the Christian Zionist um, kind of constituency within, you know, the evangelicals, um, they're not a marginal phenomenon. And so, you know, this kind of anti-Semitism is like, it's considered to be completely irrelevant. Like, it, it, it doesn't matter yeah. that the real anti-Semitism. But like, when we see criticism of Israel or, you know, things uh within the labor party then that is you know that is supposed to be anti-semitic and twisted out of all recognition and it's um it's really turning things on its head and it also i think makes it so real examples of anti-semitism kind of uh don't don't um incite the urgency that they should because people are so used to and like the boy who cried wolf with anti-semitism yeah. they're so used to someone calling something critical of Israel anti-Semitic that it gets hard to decipher, uh, right. to navigate through real real justified claims of anti-Semitism versus these fabricated ones. And I just was curious if you could lay out, uh, Asa, this is your stream, Danny, so you can veto my question. But <laughs> I, for the American audience, if you could just lay out kind of an abbreviated um, history of, of what happened to Corbyn, because I think it's a lot of Americans don't know that. 
the history of it, but also because we don't have a parliamentary system, it's very different the way political re leaders rise and fall. Yes. Yes. Well, I'll just yeah. I'll just want to add to that yeah. question because it was going to be it was very similar. Actually, there was going to be a similar question I was going to ask. But could you talk about the U.S.? You do talk about the U.S. role in all of this because, um, well, I'm sure many people are familiar with the U.S.'s relationship with Israel being a very close one. Um, the U.S. is often talking about interference in its own elections by hostile foreign powers, supposedly mainly Russia and China. But here it seemed like the United States was working in concert with the Israel lobby to bring down Jeremy Corbyn. So if you could also just add that in. Yeah, that's a really good point. And yeah, that's that's what I kind of opened my book with. Well, Katie, in a nutshell, what happened to Corbyn was so for the U.S. viewers, the way um, so obviously we have a. Uh, parliamentary system which means the um, elected lawmaker with the most support within his or her political party gets to become the prime minister when that party wins um, government and so in opposition as the Labour Party was and is um, Corbyn was the leader of the opposition and he was only elect I mean the Labour Party has always been a very pro pro imperialist party a very you know and it was often very pro-Israel, uh, although that was on the decline anyway before Corbyn. But um, it was kind of a miracle that Corbyn, because he was the most left-wing member of parliament for Labour, really. Um, and I would argue probably the most left-wing member of parliament. But he um, was only elected because there was a change of rules, which made it, in 2015, which made it easier for just n normal members of the public really to vote. Like we don't have, like like you have primaries where in the US when anyone basically can vote for, you know, you just have to register as a Democrat and you can vote, you could have voted for Bernie Sanders. Well, we, we don't really, it's not as open here. And you have to actually be a member of like a, a card carrying subs pay, you know, dues paying member of the, that political party to vote in their internal elections. But in 2015, Labour opened that up a bit. They, they winded it out a bit. They made it easier. You just had to pay like a nominal three pounds, um, you know, to just say you were a supporter and you could, you could vote in the internal elections. Now, ironically, that was actually started by the right of the Labour Party because they wanted to make it more like the, the the Hillary Clinton Democrats and they thought oh well you know we'll get a new Tony Blair in that way because they're so convinced that everyone supports them and they're sort of clueless of how unpopular they were but it backfired on them and basically all the lefties and uh, people who are supportive of the anti-war movement people who are supportive of anti-racism people who are supportive of the Palestine Solidarity Movement and people um, you know maybe older people who had left the Labour Party in disgust during the Tony Blair years all of a sudden rejoined the Labour Party in 2015 because they knew Jeremy Corbyn because he'd been at their protests, leading their protests for so many years. And so they joined the Labour Party and lo and behold, he won, like massively, convincingly. Um, long story short, tell it, I tell it all in the book, but he was so delegitimised over the course of five years. You know, there was coup attempts, there was constant coup attempts against him by his MPs that he, um, in the end, he lost the... Uh, he. He, 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 there was two general elections, 2017 general election. He surprised everyone. He did very well. Didn't quite win, but he, he inflicted a defeat on um, the ruling Conservative Party, which actually lost seats. He came very, very close to becoming prime minister. Tw so they ramped up the anti-Semitism smears. 2019, it worked to such... It wasn't the only issue, but I argue it was certainly one of the main issues Um uh, that um, that helped to defeat him. He lost the general election in 2019. Um, and then the following year, he was expelled from the Labour Party altogether because he argued that the extent, although that, and he, I mean, he made a very, in my view, a very mild statement. And it, in, I mean, in my, in my opinion, it was too mild. But he say, stated that the extent of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party had been um, overstated by his political enemies inside and without the part, inside and outside the party, which is just a fact. It's just objectively true, um, as I show in the book. And because of that, he was kicked out of the party. Um, and now he is 
he's still a because of the parliamentary system he's a, still an elected mp in his local constituency in north london but he's not a labor party mp which means when the next general election comes which should be within a year or so um he will not be the labor party candidate for mp so he's facing a stark choice of standing as an independent which is very very hard to win without the support of a political party or basically quitting giving up as, a, as an mp and i don't know doing what retiring into uh, front like you know uh grassroots politics in some way um most mps faced with that choice could not win uh, you know it, it's very hard without the party machine and people by and large vote for the political party but i do think jeremy Corbyn's a bit of an exception he's got you know a, a, a large Let's amount of years He's, he's, got a lot, he's got a large amount of support <laughs> within his local constituency in North London, which is a very largely, you know, despite the fact that North, uh, Islington contains some very rich areas, um, incredibly rich areas. It also, you know, it, it also contains some working class, a lot of working class and uh, immigrant areas who are very, very supportive of Jerry Corbyn. So he could win as an independent. It's possible. Um, but whether he does or not, we'd have to wait and see. So that's the situation that we're in now. I mean, of course, he would have that support because he's been quite clear all through his career that he actually could represent the working classes, which no one, no, nobody else opening and closing their mouth in the Labour, but certainly in anyone who knows Keir Starmer or any of that. What I want to know from you is, I, unfortunately, I haven't got around to reading your book yet, but I will because I know you've sent one to my house, and thank you very much as soon as I get back. What I want to know is this, whether you have a theory about why Jeremy didn't stand up. I, I Look, you've got it. It's over your shoulder. Oppose IHRA. At the Labour Party conference in 2019, I was going, go on then, tell him to F off. Why didn't he say, no, this is rubbish? Because he didn't. And it was yeah. a weird moment, I thought. And Unfortunately, I mean, look, this is this is an issue I get into in the book as well. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn at his heart is is you know it, he's kind of a pacifist, and he 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 tries to be a, a reckon sort of you know a, 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 he tries to reconcile opposing people, even when they're irreconcilable. And so that meant some really difficult issues within his own party which, you know, he, a lot of members argued, a lot of his supporters, that he should have been, he should have been a little bit ruthless sometimes and just kick them out. And he didn't do that. And um, it just led to some really difficult problems. He did try and make a stand. I mean, I do talk about it. He did try and make a stand <laughs> against the IHRA, um, really alone in, to, you know, with due credit to him within um, the Labour Party. But he, I think he never really got control of the party machine. And he didn't even have, you know, he didn't really even have people, he didn't even have his own people, really, who were supporting him within the Labour Party machine. It was, um, it it was, um, yeah, it was very but difficult. Do you think that's like a social deficiency? That he's a bit diffident, actually, underneath it all. Man. Anyway, I, you know, there's a subtext in here. And that's something I'd like to bring up, which is because... It's an elephant that is in every room where a conversation goes on about this kind of stuff. And it is this, the world rules-based order, you know, question, and how that relates to Paris 1948 and the ICC and the IJC and the rule of law. And how is it that that is such a minefield that we human beings have never managed to get come even close to figuring out yeah we put the un together at the end of the second world war but we never figured out how to actually encourage the idea of a real rules-based order i.e international law because international law is toothless because none of the main criminals are signed up to the treaty of rome or the or, or the icc and to their jurisdictions. So they just go, well, yeah, they're all right. We'll use them when we want to, but you can't ever prosecute one of us through them because we are not signatories. The United States of America obviously is the main 
culprit in this way. So, so this elephant is stomping around every single room that we step into. I don't know why I brought it up, really, because um, what does that have to do with criminalizing anti-Semitism? I, I know what it has to do with it. It has to do with, do we or do we not believe in fundamental human rights? If we do, like the Jewish household that um, Naomi Wimborn and Dreesi grew up in, we would have inculcated into our hearts the need to stand with the oppressed, to look after the poor, to help the old lady across the road. We would need, we would be filled with the need to be the good Samaritan. I don't mean to denigrate Samaritans. <laughs> I've actually, I've, I've met, some, I, I, I met some of the Samaritans, actually, some years well, ago. Yeah. They still, anyway. you know, they, they, they still exist in uh, near Nablus. I want to make light of this because I think it's really important. It's something that I lie awake about, you know, thinking and dreaming about. Imagine a world where it became required to observe other people's fundamental human rights. It's only 30 articles. You can go and read it. I pointed out in a little thing I wrote the other day. It's the most translated document in the history of history and history as we know it's the writing down of things this thing that some that they wrote down in 1948 has been translated into 450 or no 555 languages the most translated document of all time so you can't say oh i can't read hebrew so i couldn't read it you know i i, I just I've just realized that I didn't answer the second part uh, that uh, Danny's part of the question and th th about the American involvement in, in uh, Corbyn. And, you know, we do the opposition to Corbyn and we do see um, there was definitely some evidence that the British deep state, by, by which I mean the permanent military security apparatus that has a massive say in how Britain is operated, and has no democratic control over it. Uh, in other words, MI5, MI6, the, the, the equivalents of, in a way, of FBI and CIA. Um, they were involved in um, attacking Corbyn. Um, the investigative journalist Matt Kennard did a, a study uh, and he found is a sort of, he did a sort of investigation a few years ago and he found that, and I mentioned this in chapter one of the book, there was 34 national articles in the British press during um, the Corbyn, the first few years of the Corbyn years that were openly sourced by um, either MI5 or MI6, you know, anonymous MI5, MI6 sources saying that Corbyn was a threat to national security. So that was done quite openly. Um, and there was, you know, it, when Corbyn was first running for the leadership of, of the uh, Labour Party, for example, he was, um, uh, there was a story in the Sunday Times, the Times of London, Sunday Times, um, a, front line pa a front page headline saying that a serving senior general in the British military said there would be a mutiny if Corbyn oh, yeah. became Prime Minister of Britain. Uh, and then, you know, we a few years later, we saw um, British Army soldiers shooting on a shooting range with a using Corbett, Corbyn's image for target practice. And so all these kind of um, delegitimization, I suppose you could say, of him was out there. And this was the stuff they were doing openly. So what were they doing behind the scenes? I don't <laughs> think we fully know yet. And also um, Mike, um, Mike Pence. The former vice my... president, or Pompeo, Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, Pompeo the CIA, Mike, former it. CIA director. Pompeo, yeah, it was Pompeo. Pompeo. Yeah, that's right. Evangelical, he... evangelical. Don't let the Italian yes. last name confuse you. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, he said that um, he had a meeting with. Um, it was it was reported in the Washington Post that he had a meeting with high level Israel oh. lobbyists in the U.S where he said, you know, Jeremy Corbyn has a real chance of becoming prime minister. This yeah. was in 2019. But we're not going to wait 
to we're, we're not going to wait for that to happen before we take some action against it because it would be too difficult. So what did they do? What did they do? We don't fully know yet, but I'm you know I'm trying to start telling the story of this this history. Yeah, Hello. right. He says it's like easier to un to prevent than undo, basically. We're heading up to an hour, and I wanted to maybe close the next, uh, if it's okay, 15, 20 minutes or so, if that's all right, with um, this, you know, you, Roger, you were talking about this rules-based order. Um, you know, Asa, you talk a lot about Israel meddling in the UK's electoral process during this really watershed moment in politics there with the rise of Corbyn, the, you know, there was the huge growth in both the Palestine solidarity movement, but also just uh, people becoming engaged in politics because they felt like someone represented both their anti-establishment views, but also their anti-war and pro-peace views. And oftentimes what happens is it's like a fine line. We have the Palestine solidarity movement so important to center on. But then there is this, and I think the Israel lobby tries to do this, tries to make it so unique that it is completely out of the realm of what's happening globally. So, Roger, when you brought up the rules-based order, I think of this as decaying order where the U.S. and Israel is a big part of this. Uh, their legitimacy is is really shaky right now. Um, and you have, you know, you're being attacked, Roger, for wearing this uniform and being equated to so-called SS, but you have forces that the UK and the US are supporting in Ukraine that legitimately wear these insignia and commit atrocities. You know, and that's exactly what I thought. Like I saw one of the people who was attacking Roger um, today um, was the MP Alex Sobel. And, you know, he was saying that your show in Manchester should be banned. And, and then I looked on his Twitter profile. He's got a flag, a Ukrainian flag um on his on his avatar and i googled him and he was calling you know he signed a letter calling for more weapons to be sent to ukraine well we know that um british weapons going to ukraine have been sent to arm literal nazis in ukraine namely the azov battalion you know they, they've been they've been uh i'm sure he's condemned them right <laughs> um Yes, I'm sure he has. I, 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 I don't know that. I don't know one way or the other. But the, the fact is that he, um, you know, he supports these weapons going to these these kinds of forces. Well, at the same, so you know, Roger's getting uh, attacked for, um, you know, a, a an artistic show, an anti-fascist show where he's portraying uh, fascists in order to warn right. people about fascists. And people, politicians, ironically, politicians who support literal fascists, arming literal fascists, are attacking anti-fascists. And this is then reported in the press as, you know, anti-racism. You know, it's, it's really a, a topsy-turvy country. It is. It's very topsy-turvy, yeah. And, you know, I, I sort of... Um, because of my position on Ukraine, which I'm... You know, everybody says, oh, for God's sake, stop using the Ukraine. You know, you get in, you just get in more and more and more trouble. Right. And I would say, kick your I, battles, right? They'll say. Well, yeah. My, you know, because my, well, no, I shouldn't answer the U word. Yeah, I want peace in the Ukraine. Please, please. Breaks my fucking heart that we're murdering all these young Ukrainian and Russian men and women. It's heartbreaking. And for what? And for why? Why was it ever allowed to stop? And we know that's a big, broad question. And it's not maybe that's not what we should, should be talking about here, because we, the weaponization of uh, of anti-Semitism, but the weaponization of anything that goes against the general grain of the echo chamber and what everybody is saying. You know, so I'm because I write to a teenager in the Ukraine. And, Ask her to send me a picture of her dog, which I did, and she didn't. She sent me a picture of her cat. But Alina, it's okay, babe. It's a lovely cat. I wish she was still talking to me. But a, a presence appeared over this girl's shoulder, you know, and suddenly she disappeared off the screen. No more contact at all. And I'm sad about that because why? What happened? Well, suddenly her. Our exchange of emails went from being sort of pen pally 
to being you um, are completely wrong. You're a this, that, right. or the other. There are no Nazis in Ukraine. Was the start of it. I am two hundred percent certain there are no Nazis in Ukraine. That was suddenly from talking about. Send me a picture of the dog. It went to that. I wonder if she's saying. And, and I sent one email back to Alina saying, "Ah, I I hear what you're saying about everything, but there is one thing that I'm certain you're wrong about." There are one or two Nazis in Ukraine. You know, I've read the history. I, mean, I, read, I read a lot, a lot. And there are some things that you are Ukrainian, you're there. There's some things that you don't know. You're 18 years old and you've been listening and whatever and you're absorbing, but you need to do more reading and listen to other sides of questions and things if you want to be able to make sense of the world. God knows what's happened to her, poor little girl. Who knows? Anyway, that's that's again that's that's slightly beside the point. What's happening though with the court? What's interesting about the Corbyn story to me, and I look forward to reading Ace's book, is here we were suddenly in England with the possibility of having a pop politician sitting in the big chair at the top of the table in downtown Downing Street in the cabinet room who actually cares about the working class and about the people and about the health service and about the disparity and, and inequality yeah. between in, in the structure of how things are divided up between Elon Musk and everybody else. Or, this is you know, the ironic thing. Like, Corbyn was not a radical. You know, he wasn't... Um, you know, he wasn't a communist. He wasn't. I mean, he was really a social democrat. You know, in and I argue in the book. Oh, that, politics, that would be to have one of those as a prime yeah. minister. <laughs> you know, he was. He, he had moderate policies for a better Britain. You know, and and his policies were popular. You know, the, you know why he was fact, attacked. He was attacked by the Americans certainly and by the ruling class in England because. He was not a supporter of the idea of the UK as a vassal state, owned, run, told what to do, scurrying around at the behest of their masters in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And the UK is absolutely that. That's what Keir Starmer is. He, yeah. Did you see Pilger's um, documentary about the death of the National Health Service? There's that bit in it where there's yeah. that woman who'd worked all her life as a nurse in the, in the NHS. And then it had been bought by an American company and she suddenly realized that it was all changing and that it had no longer had anything to do with helping people or curing anybody or treating people. It only had to do with profit margin. That's all, nothing else. And you go, well, that... We are now a vassal state, so that is what we are. That's what we have to do now, is that, because that's what the masters do. That's what the United States is. Now, none of it is set up to help people. It's set up to create the biggest profit margins possible, and that's all. And, and, the, and the reason, obviously, that they're supporting the settler colonial Israeli government is because they've managed to maintain that in the United States. They've killed almost all the indigenous people. They're no longer a threat to them, and they're still trying to kill them now. So they feel secure in this idea that they can put pictures of Corbyn up in their ranches in Texas and use it for target practice because it just kind of feels good old boy and it's okay. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very sick society and that's what, that's what is difficult. That's what's so difficult because they can so powerful and they've got so many weapons and they've got some... And they've got really kind of sick people running the show. And so that's why, that's why the, the U word is so dangerous because you look, thank, that's what I was saying earlier. Thank goodness for Jeffrey Sachs. And he's now marginalized. Yeah. So I've, I've listened to a couple of his monologues recently and he keeps telling it more and more and more like I believe it is. And I know Danny does because I've, it's kind of mingled up in my brain. Of, hey, this is the truth. Look, here's the truth. So yeah. what are we doing? 
this, which is probably going to kill us all. I say that every night to the audience. Before I sing Two Sons in the Sunset, I say, this is a narrative of Luke. He's driving home. Suddenly the World War Three happens. And he bounds to a crisp. And so do his wife and children. And so does everybody else. And suddenly there's this little black cold rock on its own going through space. And we've all gone. And so have all the little furry animals and the vegetables. Everything's gone. And, you, and, and there won't be anybody there to go, why did we do that? Why did, why did we do that? Thank goodness we've got the odd people like us in this room and Jeffrey Sachs and a number of others who are going, why are we even thinking about doing that? Why? John Minsheimer, now the great voice out there in the yeah. world that nobody listens to. Let's By the, uh, the re what? Go on. No, I was just going to say quickly, I mean, this is a little bit different, but I was going to bring up the... The, the yeah. petition that we wrote for Roger, which I've now updated, I put it in the private chat, uh, Danny, got it. because yep. got uh, it got, we thought we won and we did win. Let Pink Floyd's Roger Waters perform in Frankfurt, Germany. I just tried to update it. So it says, let him perform uh, all over. I guess it didn't save my update, but we obviously have to update this petition so that uh, it calls for people, to, you know, because you're going to get more smeared or you're going to get, they're calling for investigation. So, yeah, okay, uh, there, it should be updated now. Okay, I can but, refresh. Uh, we can I can't that. Tell you, this has been so great, this petition, Katie. It made a oh, huge difference. Great. I think. Yeah. But if this, this is an it, example of it, successfully sure fighting yeah. back, Roger. This is what you've done, you know, like you, you took Well, let's wait and see just how successful I am. But I'll tell you right. one thing, I ain't backing <laughs> down. There's no. Good for you. Uh, you know, none. Yeah. However big the other echo chamber is, as we know, Gilmore's idiot wife, you know, sent a silly tweet, absolutely salacious, disgusting tweet, which he then endorsed. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the petition is updated, and um, I sent it in the chat for those of you who want to uh connect with it sign it because yeah it seems like the attacks uh, on you uh, roger are Continue. are escalating continuing and escalating as you uh move through europe but how yeah, serious well, i'm nearly I'm... done with europe now but the last two days yeah after the jerusalem post piece of nonsense they just lie but then it gets picked up as if it's real by all the Western media, because they've just been sitting there waiting for the moment when they think they can deliver the coup de grace and get rid of me forever. So, so that I become absolutely unspeakable persona non grata. Yeah, which is what they tried to do to Corbyn and they did to several uh, of Jeremy Corbyn's supporters in the Labour Party. They picked them off one by one. You know, so there was Ken Livingston... You know, they successfully did it to Ken Livingston. They made him into this monster, and he yeah. was kicked out, of the, forced out of the Labour Party. Went one by one. Yes, Naomi as well. Another example. They they pick them off one by one, and they're trying to to do it to you to sort of have this sort of. But they as, didn't as, get it by the state affiliate broadcasting company, the BBC. Who all yeah. very proud of themselves, but no, they're not. They're just a mouthpiece. But as, as we're live streaming, your Frankfurt concert is in two days, I think. Is that yes, right? Yes, I wish I could go. I'm so how, you, how are you feeling about it? It's yesterday. I did it last night. Oh, how yesterday. was it? Was it, it was brilliant. Historic? It really, it really went really, really well. And I, I gather from places that it went. I'm sure if you go on the net, you can find responses to, to whatever. I looked wow. at it a little bit. And given that it's edited as it's happening and it's all live and it's, I think it was great. I really do. Excellent. So, but the other thing I wanted to say is we were talking about my tour. That's in, this is Prague, right? I'm still here. We're leaving tomorrow. I've got one more gig, which is Frankfurt, which is sold out. I mean, it was sold out before they started trying to cancel it. So we That's must great. always remember the open-minded, broad-minded, music-loving, good people of Frankfurt, 10,000 of them at least, who went, yeah, I want to see that. Well, yeah. and, and but it's the 
council and the government, the local government of the state of Hesse. No, you can't see it. We've decided that this guy is an anti-Semite. And in... But you forced them to back down by take, you know, rallying this petition that, you know, Katie put together and by taking them to court and you won in a yeah. court decision. Yeah, I just took out an injunction because I discovered that it was actually against the law. They do have some freedom of speech laws in Germany, which, and, and what was interesting was that the government, the, the court in Frankfurt actually abided by what is the law. It's another, so it's a good indication of, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a kind of global system of law? The only time I ever spoke ever in a debate was at my school when I was 15 years old. I'll never forget it, at the Cambridge High School for Boys, this house believes in the principle of a world government. And the implications of that are kind of obvious, but it's sort of what I was talking about. That's kind of what the elephant in the room is. Because if you take an idea of international law that we all agreed to abide by, it kind of extrapolates into, ah, this might be a good way of surviving of working out how to work together um, to eventually work toward the idea of peace on earth. And then maybe we can figure out what to do about climate change and, and inequality and blah, 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 and all of that. But until we have a system where we can agree what is and what isn't legal, it's all a bit difficult, I, th I find it. Well, I want to ask one maybe final question and to begin with Asa, perhaps, and then uh, we can go around to Katie and Roger, is uh, for those who watch this show, uh, we cover a lot of, you know, the big questions, Russia, China, world geopolitics. What can your book teach us? Because there is a huge theme here of, of course, Israeli interference. Um, and, of course, the United States being uh, behind the interference in the UK's political process. But what can your book teach us about this role that they play overall, this U.S.-Israel partnership? And then, of course, the European countries like the UK and uh, their uh, staunch pro-Israel establishment and other European countries now attacking Roger. It seems like this is all coming together to a... Um, kind of coordinated alliance of countries that are playing a certain role in the world. So what can your book teach us about that? And, and um, especially given that, you know, there is no uh, disconnect, it seems, between the Israel and the, Pal you know, the Palestine solidarity movement, what Israel is doing in Palestine, and uh, everything else that's going on geopolitically. Yeah, so I try in the book to, and I do, I draw on the scholarship of the Columbia University professor, Joseph Massad, you know, this uh, leading Palestinian intellectual. Targeted who, by Barry Weiss, by the way. Mm -hmm. Targeted by Barry Weiss for cancellation unsuccessfully, thank, thankfully. Uh, but she, yeah, she did try to, to, you know, get him denied tenure because she opposed his, uh, you know, his, his anti-Zionist views, essentially. Um, he emphasizes in his scholarship that Palestine is not unique and that the Israeli occupation and Zionism isn't unique as much as it tries to uh, claim that it is. Yes, you know, it has unique features. Every, ev you know, every historical instance has unique features, but it's not unique in the sense that it is a settler colonial movement um, within, you know, what is called the Middle East, um, but may more accurately be referred to as West Asia. Um, you know, there are other instances of settler colonialism that were defeated, such as um, French Algeria uh, and the Algerian liberation struggle uh, uh, was successful in removing uh, French settler colonialism from Algeria. Of course, there's differences too. Um, but, you know, the, uh, 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 and as well, as, sim as uh, you know, Roger already mentioned, South Africa is, is a very common comparison that's made with 
with uh, with Palestine and with the uh, Israeli settler colonial project is, is very similar in a lot of ways to South Africa. Again, some differences, um, but um, there is a commonalities. And what I try and argue in the book, and I think I think successfully, um, is that the role that Zionism played within the Labour Party was uh, what I call a vanguard of reaction. So it was a reactionary vanguard because it was there on the front lines against Corbyn. Um, the Israel lobby acted as this kind of um, this uh, agent of imperialism, you could say, as it has always been, uh, as always been Zionism's role, has always been Israel's role. Um, you know, we see it in even the, the there's a bit in the book where I mentioned the Histadrut, which is the um, the Israeli um, labor uh, union federation, which excluded Arab members until the 1950s. Um, so it's a racist trade union, essentially. Um, but it, they, um, Philip Agee, the CIA whistleblower, revealed in his book that the Histadra acted, worked on behalf of the CIA and CIA labor operations. And so we see, you know, that the pro-Israel lobby acted as this vanguard for empire in a way within the Labour Party to abort the Corbyn project because of the threat of democracy, the threat of, you know, proletarian democracy, the threat of socialism and the threat of popular control in the, the, within this country um, and that, that, that the Labour Party would be transformed from an imperialist project into a popular project acting in the will of the people, doing these terribly, awfully, radically thing, radical things like nationalizing the rail which even most tory voters support because you know the the um the privatized uh, rail lines are so terrible uh, and so overpriced and so forth and so i think i think that's the role it it played mm. yeah um i will leave it to katie and roger to give any last remarks maybe on that question or anything else Hmm. Katie? Well, uh, read this book. Uh, support Danny's channel. Support uh, the Katie Halper Show channel. Support Roger. Sign the petition. And um, yeah, don't let people uh, pretend that there's some monolithic Jewish voice that's reactionary and Zionist. Make sure that you uplift voices of, of course, Palestinians who have been making the arguments for decades, um, but also I think, you know, given that people constantly try to portray Zionism as anti-Semitic, I think it's important to point out that, you know, well, at Selim, the Israeli human rights organization has declared Israel a, an apartheid state. Um, of course, again, this is something Palestinians have been saying, but I think that there is, uh, I, I know a lot of people get stopped when they're accused of anti-Semitism. So I would just suggest that they say things like, well, human rights are international. Most Zionists are Christian uh, right people who are anti-Semites. And there are countless Jews who are erased and marginalized in silence who reject uh, Israel and APEC and listen to them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. While, while we're on at the mentioning of people, as you know, as, as Katie was doing then, uh, I got a request this morning through the email from Double Down News in England, uh, and they, it rang a faint bell and whatever. And that is where those two things I was talking about, Naomi. Naomi's clip, yeah. Naomi, Naomi and Ken Loach, yeah. But there was another one. Is it Mohammed Kurd? Who's the guy from Sheikh Jarrah? Yeah, Mohammed yeah. Good looking kid who's doing great yeah, who work. for the nation so, and gets. Yeah. Boycott and so he, there was time, a thing yeah. from, from him on there as well. And so, and while, while we're talking about things that we should watch, apart from Danny, and uh, let's not forget uh, Gabo Mate's son, Aaron Mate. Oh, the right, he's just been added. And Max and blah, blah, blah. And there are a lot of other brothers and sisters in our small community of truth spreaders. And so, yeah, we should all be supporting one another. Um, uh, and encouraging people to, 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 to the, the voice of reason is that I just made, I'm going to finish up by saying this, I'm counting wares now, 
I recently made a new recording of the dark side of the moon. I know. Ooh! Sacrilege! <laughs> yeah, well, wait till you hear it. I think it's, it's going to come out in September, I think. And what, what am I trying to say? Oh, yeah. In, the, in one of the songs at the end, just before time, or I think it's maybe, it's after on the, on the run and it's in the introduction to time. And there's a huge battle going on. It's a dream I had. And, blah, blah. and then suddenly, in the middle of this conflagration, a voice says, be gone. I says, be gone. And the battle stops. And then it's the introduction to time. But then the next, it's, my, it's my voice, obviously. And I, but I say, it was the voice of reason. It had been there all along hidden in the stones in the rivers. So I'm, I'm borrowing from, and a river runs through it there from the lost page. It's, it was hidden in plain sight. So anyway, I won't tell you the rest of it, but <laughs> we'll have to listen. the voice of reason is what we all need to be searching for. And it's very yeah. hard to find because they, the oligarchs, the ruling class, are trying to keep us from it. They're trying yeah. to reason away from us they do not want us to get our hands on it they mm. want to destroy all the books they are book burners mm -hmm. they want us to keep staring at our iphones right and but they don't want us to think that's that's it really so thank you all of you yeah thank you the gray zone and thank you a double double down news and thank you for everybody who's trying to give us the opportunity to use our brains for what they were meant for, which is to connect with our hearts and get closer to all our brothers and sisters all over the world, not further away. Hmm. Yeah. If I so, could, Danny, just yes. um, plug my work. Um, I, uh, so I, yeah, I write mainly at the electronic intifada, electronic intifada.net. Um, and all my work I publish on my newsletter here, asoinstanley.substack.com. You can subscribe to that and you'll see um, original articles um, there and all, also reposting of my work from EI and other places. Um, and my book is published on the 30th in all good bookshops on the 30th of May. Um, and is available to order now from allbooks.com, orbooks.com. Can I just plug one thing also? Uh, yeah. Which is, uh, so there's the Katie Halper Show, which is patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show. You get to see a bunch of uh, Patreon-only interviews with Roger, but of course you also get to see a bunch of available for everyone interviews with Roger at youtube.com slash the Katie Halper Show or wherever you find your podcasts. Also, I co-host Useful Idiots, speaking of Aaron Mate, um, which is, thank you, which is at um, sub, usefulidiots.substack.com. This week, we have a great interview with two Syrian guests who give you a perspective that you don't hear usually when people say, listen to Syrians, because they're not talking about uh, all Free Syrians. Syrian army for you. Yeah, Syrian, exactly, Syrians, right. Usually. Yes. Right. So check that out at uh, YouTube and Substack and wherever you listen to your podcast. And I'll be doing a live taping of the Katie Halper Show in New York City with special guest Brianna Joy Gray on June 10th at 7 p.m. Coming full circle, it's actually at this place called the Francis Kite Club at 40 Avenue C. And it's a space that Or Books, your publisher, Asa, Or Books uh, works out of. So it's a cool space that Or Books has uh is there too, the Francis Kite Club. It's going to be a free event. Um, there'll be an event right soon, but make sure that you come on down June 10th to see me interviewing Brianna Joy Gray. Hmm. June 10th, Saturday, Great. 7 p.m., yeah. And then Great. we will have to do a live Useful Idiots taping with Roger Waters as a guest. Totally. Um, well, it was great to have all of you. Everyone stick around. I got some announcements, uh, maybe some stories to cover while I have you on a Friday before Memorial Day. But thank you so much, Roger, Katie, and of course, Asa for writing this great book. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, everyone, everyone should pick it up. It. I put it again in the chat. Um, I will put some links after the video is over uh, in the description so that you all can find it if you're catching the replay. 
All right. Well, take care. Have a good rest of your evenings or afternoons, everyone. Um, And uh, hopefully we can connect again into some extent soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. All right. All right. So that was great. Um, And, yeah, stick around. I have some announcements, but I really want to get to some stories while I have you because this channel is actually entering vacation mode soon. So do stick around. Um, Yeah, let me take these off, actually, because I don't need them. That was a great conversation. Um, The book is very much well worth the read. Um, I've been getting into it myself as time allows. So, yeah, with that said, keep, keep it here.